In this video, we're going to cover PS1 emulation using the Swan Station Core on Xbox Series X and S. Alright everybody, we covered accurate PS1 emulation in another video, so this time around it is time for upscaling galore utilizing the Swan Station Core. Now, some of you might be asking, why Swan Station, not Duck Station? Well, Swan Station is an updated fork of the Duck Station Libretro Core. So, the Duck Station Core within RetroArch is actually pretty old and built on an older, closed sourced version of Duck Station. So, Swan Station is going to be your most up to date version of that emulator within RetroArch. Now, before we get started, this guide is assuming you have set up RetroArch using one of my provided methods. If not, check out the playlist in the description below to get set up. But let's jump in. Now, step one to getting PlayStation games up and running on your Xbox Series X and S, you need to source a PS1 BIOS file. There are three main BIOS files you need. SCPH5500 for Japanese games, SCPH5501 for US region games, and SCPH5502 for PAL games. But again, once you have your BIOS files sourced, they do need to be named exactly as shown here. Otherwise, they will not be detected and not work. If you happen to still own a PS1 of any variety or a PS Classic, I do have BIOS dumping guides on how to get your BIOS files from them. For this video in particular, I'm using my PS Classic dumped BIOS files. But once you have these sorts, we just need to put them in our RetroArch system folder. If your RetroArch system folder is still on your internal SSD, Go ahead and open up Durango FTP and start your file share. And then back on your computer, access your file share using your preferred method. Open your local folder, find your RetroArch folder, local state folder, system folder, and drag your BIOS files right inside. I already had them here, so I'm just going to tell it to override them. And there we go, they are now placed and ready to go. If you have your system folder moved over to USB, Plug your USB drive into your computing device, open it up, open up the system folder you created, and drag the BIOS files inside. Again, I already had them there, so I'm just telling it to overwrite. And once your BIOS files are placed, we are ready to move on to game setup. Now, PlayStation games can come in a variety of formats. The most typical you'll see are BinQ format, but you can use older formats too, like CCD, or convert them over to PVP and CHUD. In this video, we are going to be converting our games over to CHUD as it is one of the best compression methods and a lot easier than manually converting everything over to PVP format. If you have games that are in ISO MP3 format, find better rips. So to convert games from BinQ format to CHUD, I have a prepackaged zip folder here that contains CHUDman as well as Sleeper Ninja's QGDI to CHUD bat file. But there will be a link in the description below to download this zip file. Just get it extracted. You'll be left with chudman.exe and QGDI to CHUD. Just put these files in the same directory as your PlayStation games, and then run the QGDI to CHUD bat, and it will begin compressing your games into CHUD format. So just sit patiently and let it do its thing. And once the program is completed running, just press any key to exit out of it. Now, one of the best things about this bat file is it is able to compress games that are in subfolders. So, for example, I had Chrono Cross, Red Alert, Final Fantasy VII, and Metal Gear Solid in subfolders. And it has created CHUD files based on those games as well. Unfortunately, I just have to re-add them to my subfolder here in a second, but that's no big deal. But once the conversion is completed, we could just clean up all of our old binq files. We don't really need them anymore. Make sure you have them backed up somewhere if you don't want to lose them. And then you could also delete chudman and the qgdi to chudbat file. And that leaves us with much cleaner looking PS1 games. Now I'm just going to... Delete everything out of my subfolders here for multi-disc games real quick. And then put my multi-disc games back inside of them. There we go. Now there is one more setup step to getting multi-disc games perfected for use on Beetle PSX or Swan Station. And that is to create M3U files. So go into the folder you have your multi-disc games stored in. 
make a new text document. You can name it whatever you want, doesn't matter. I mean, you typically name it after the game though. But once the text file is created, go ahead and open it up. And we are going to add the name of both disks or more, if there's more than two disks. And we're going to copy the file names and paste them into this text document. And you need to make sure to include the extensions. If for whatever reason the extensions aren't showing up on Win for Windows users, you can go to the View tab and check mark the file name extensions box here. Anyway, once you have all the disks in your text file, just go ahead and save it, close out of it, and then we need to change the extension from .txt to m3u. And it'll pop up warning here, getting mad at you. That's fine. Just click yes. And there we go. Chrono Cross is now ready to go. So I'm going to repeat that process on my other three multi-disc games. And there we go, all of my multi-disc games are now ready to go with proper M3U files. Now PlayStation games can be run from the internal SSD if you have an S drive set up, or from a USB drive. So I'm just going to copy these over to my USB drive real quick. So go to my games folder. I already have a PlayStation games folder in here from earlier setup attempts, but they're all in just normal bin queue format, and I'm just going to update them to this new chud format. So I'm just going to delete that folder. And copy the new folder right on in. Or if you want to put them on the S drive, just open up your Durango FTP file share again. Make sure that server's running. S, Program Files, Windows Apps, RetroArch folder with the x64 at the end, your Made Games folder, and then just drag them in. But once you have your BIOS and games placed, we can go ahead and just back out of everything on our computing devices and plug our USB drive back into the Xbox and load up RetroArch. Once you have RetroArch booted, you're free to begin loading up your PlayStation content. So one method of doing so is to go to load content, navigate to the directory your games are stored. So if you're on dev mode using USB, that should be under E. Retail mode USB should be under D. Or if you put them on the S drive. But you can find your games. Choose a game, choose a core, and tell it to run. I don't personally care for this method, so what I like to do instead is head down to Import Content and make a games playlist. Since our PlayStation games are converted over to Chud format, we need to do a manual scan. So, Content Directory, choose the location where your PlayStation games are stored that were just outlined previously. So for me, they're under the E drive under PlayStation games, and I'm going to tell it to scan this directory. System name, you can press right on your D-pad to scroll down to Sony and find Sony PlayStation. Default core, this tutorial we are covering Swan Station, so find uh, Sony section here and find PlayStation Swan Station. For this first scan, I'm going to turn scan recursively off as I want it to just find all of my chud files in the root of my PlayStation games folder. With that said, I'm going to start the scan. And now that that scan's done, I'm going to come back up here and turn scan recursively back on and set a file extension for M3U. And press start once that's typed in. Now it'll search my entire PlayStation directory, including subfolders, specifically for M3U files, which is what my multi-disc games are running off of. And I'm going to start the scan. Now back on the main menu, I have a new PlayStation playlist here on the left with all of my games, including multi-disc games, all showing up as a single file. But then I could just choose a game and tell it to run. And if everything is placed correctly, you will get your PlayStation boot animation and begin playing your game. And there we have it, PlayStation games up and running on your Xbox Series X and S using the Swan Station Core. Now, before we go any further, let's talk about some things that you might be interested in here, including control setup and multi-disc game changing. So, going into our RetroArch Quick Menu, if we head down to the Options tab, you'll see there is a Port Settings option inside. 
And from here, we could change a number of different things, including multi-taps and player one and two controller types. So by default, every PlayStation game should play with the digital controller. That is why it is set as the default option. But you can also change it over to a DualShock for supported titles. Now, some games will not work with the DualShock. You'll get a no controller warning. So you could just come in here and change it back to digital if that is the case. And then you could do the same thing for controller two. You could set it to a digital or a DualShock. Now, for those of you that like to play Metal Gear Solid and have experience in the Psycho Mantis fight, you know that you need to use a controller in port 2 to beat them. So, enabling a controller here is very important. But rather than having two controllers hooked up to your Xbox to do so, you can easily swap your controller port for your Player 1 controller over to port 2 by backing out of the Options tab here. Scroll down to Controls, Port 1 Controls, and change the mapped port between 1 and 2. This way, when the fight begins, you can swap your port over to port 2, play the fight out how it's supposed to be done, and then once it's finished, you can swap it back to port 1. You can also remap any individual keys here as you see fit. Alright, now let's talk about swapping discs on multi-disc titles. For this example, I have loaded up into Chrono Cross Disc 2, and when I tell it to start a new game, it tells me to please insert Disc 1. To do this, head into your RetroArt Quick Menu. And from here, you can navigate down towards the bottom here where you'll find a disc control tab. Opening this up, you'll see an option to eject your disc. Press A on this, and a new current disc index option will pop up. And when you press A on this, you'll see all of the discs listed within your M3U file that you created earlier. So just press A on the disc you need to insert, and then tell it to insert the disc. and your game should load up as normal. And then you can begin playing your games as you normally would. But now let's go ahead and cover some of the more advanced core options available to us within Swan Station. So going into our RetroArt Quick Menu, you can scroll down to Options here. And our first option is Console Settings. And our first option is Console Region. This is set to Auto Detect by default, and that should be fine for most use cases, but you can manually set a region here if needed. Next, NTSC U BIOS. You can change between different uh, US BIOS files here. Fast boot, if you don't want to have the PS1 animation start every time you load up a game, you can turn this option on. Do note it does have some mild compatibility issues with some titles. I've never encountered one, but if you got a game that won't boot with this option on, just turn it off and try it again. Or you can just leave it off and get that wonderful Sony animation every time. CD-ROM region check, you can leave this off. CD-ROM read thread, leave this on. Next, you can apply CD-ROM image patches. If you have a PPF image patch, you can put it in the same directory as your game image, and it will apply them when you load the game up. Next up, preload CD image to RAM. If you want to pre-cache your entire disk image, you can turn this option on. Next, you have the option to mute CD audio. So if your game uses CDDA or XA audio, you could disable it if you just want to have no background music. Next, we have a couple of CD loading speed hacks here. So you can increase the drive speed of your emulated PlayStation to reduce on loading times. Do note that this can break certain games, so experiment at your own risk. If you encounter issues, just drop it back down. And next up is the CPU execution mode. Leave this on your compiler. This is the fastest option available. Next, we have advanced settings. First up, CD-ROM async read-ahead mode. So since you have your CD-ROM on a thread, you can set a run-ahead time to help reduce load stutters or any minor hiccups you might encounter. So it's set to 16 MS by default. That's perfectly good, but if you want to, you can increase it. Next up, CPU overclocking. So anyone that grew up in the PS1 era knows that games do not run at a good frame rate a lot of the time on PS1. So with this CPU overclocking option, we can increase the PS1 CPU horsepower to overcome pretty much any frame drop that was CPU related. It's pretty awesome. So as you can see here in Chrono Cross, the frame rate has uh, jumped up to a full locked 60 FPS and it's pretty nuts. Definitely a different way to experience the game. Now not all games will take to CPU overclocking, so do be aware of it. We're going to skip over a couple things here and go down to the CPU recompiler iCache. I like to turn this option on, gives a bit more accuracy. We're going to skip down a few options again and head down to internal runahead. 
So if you are susceptible to input latency, you can try enabling some run ahead frames to improve your emulation experience. This can be pretty demanding, so do be aware of that. And we're gonna skip the last option here. Next up, enhancement settings, the tab that will be of most interest to most of you, I imagine. Inside, we're gonna skip over GPU renderer. We wanna leave this on Direct 3D 11, but we can increase the resolution scale of our PS1 games. So let's go for a full 9x scale for 4K while having that 400% overclock. And there we go, there is full 4K PS1 games running at 60 FPS. There, that's just pretty, pretty awesome. We're going to skip over use software renderer for readbacks and head down to multi-sample anti-aliasing. So if you scale your games up to 4K, you don't really need to enable this option, but they are here for you if you still want them. Next, true color rendering. You can turn this on. It'll disable dithering and give you a bit better color depth. Doesn't really have the right look for PS1 games in my mind, but once you upscale this high, you can't really see the dithering anyway, so might as well turn it on. Scale dithering, leave that on. Disable interlacing. This is kind of a sort of force 480p mode on 480i content. So I like to turn this one on. Now for you PAL users, you might be interested in force NTSC timings here. It might make your games run a bit faster. This next option is useful for those of you that like to do widescreen hacks. It forces your content back into a 4x3 window for 24-bit content, which is typically PlayStation FMVs. And then you can make those FMVs look a little bit better by turning on chroma smoothing. Next, texture filtering. This is set to nearest neighbor by default. I like this one personally, but for those of you that want to smooth out your image, you could choose between bilinear, jink, and then you could also do XBR. Next up, the widescreen hack. This will try to render your games in a 16x9 window. There's typically culling in the areas outside the original 4x3 window, so experiment with it as you will. All right, next up, PGXP Geometry Correction. This is a big one for PS1 gaming. So, as all of you longtime PlayStation fans know, warping textures and wobbly graphics are a staple of PlayStation 1 era gaming. And, I mean, there's a kind of nostalgic charm to it for me. I don't really mind it as much, but, I mean, you can see that things just kind of look a little funny in motion. But by enabling PGXP, you can see that things are no longer as wobbly. It doesn't 100% fix everything, but you can see that this big metal thing in the background there no longer looks bent. The boxes are stable, and as we pan the camera, there's a lot less warping and shimmering of the textures. These barrels are still not quite right in the floor shimmering here, but Overall, you can see that there's just a massive improvement to the way everything looks. And certain texture seams no longer happen either. Like, it just looks a lot better in motion, especially at higher resolution. And there's a lot of settings within PGXP that you could turn on to further enhance the effect. By default, colon correction and texture correction are on. But you can also enable a depth buffer, a vertex cache, change the CPU mode, preserve projection precision, and then you can set a tolerance. Each game is going to have different settings you're going to want to mess with, so I recommend doing a web search for PGXP for your preferred titles and just see if you can get better results by enabling some of these extra options. Otherwise, the default mode here does a pretty dang good job. Next up, display settings. You could set an aspect ratio for your games, so you could set it to a lot of different things. You could crop the overscan areas or all the borders of your game. Linear upscaling, I like to leave this on. You can also downsample your games to kind of give a more native look, but with the higher resolution internal assets. So for example, you can see that we have a more blurred image once again that is more reminiscent of a native PS1 game, but everything is of much higher fidelity. Now, one reason you might enjoy this uh, look is that it kind of like smooths out these lights and things like that that have harsher pixel grading and things like that. Next, display on-screen display messages. If you don't want those uh, messages popping up in the bottom left of your screen, you can disable this option here. 
and then you can set the active display areas here. Next up, we're gonna go back into port settings. We kind of talked about some of the options in here earlier, but first option is to load devices from save states. So if you heavily rely on save states, this uh, might be an option that you wanna turn on. Next up, memory card type one. This is set to lib retro by default, which gives every game its own memory card. For memory card slot two, I like to have a shared memory card between games just in case. Use single card for playlists, leave this one on. Next up, we have a multi-tap mode. You can enable a controller multi-tap on port one or two or both. And then we have controller one again. And if you have a game that supports DualShock controllers but doesn't enable it by default, you can toggle it on here. And if you have your controller set in digital mode, you can have it use the analog stick for the D-pad to make it a little bit easier to play those digital only games. Well, in certain regards. And then you can set the analog axis scale. So if you feel like your controller is too sensitive or not sensitive enough, you can just change the value here. And then the same options for port two. But that's gonna do it as far as core options within Swan Station are concerned. If you have certain options you wanna set for some games but not others, you can head up to manage core options and save them as a game options file. Now one last thing you could do is enable shaders. Not really as necessary when you're upscaling games this high, but if you want to load up like a nice little CRT overlay on it, something like CRT easy mode, give you a nice little uh, CRT aperture grill over your really enhanced image. Still kind of blends the pixels together a little bit better and looks really good overall. Shaders are always going to be something that's personal preference, so set them up, see what you like, and just use them. But once you have a shader set the way you like, you can go back into the shader tab and save them as a game or a core preset. So just like that. Now every time I load up a game within Swan Station, CRT Easy Mode is going to be activated. But that's going to do it for PS1 emulation within the Swan Station core. As always, if you happen to have any questions, feel free to ask me down in the comments section below. But now I do have a couple of huge favors to ask. If you haven't already, hit that like or dislike button, just depending on how much you like today's tutorial. And hit that sub and notification bell so you can see when new videos go live on the channel. Lots of content still to come, and I would love to have you along for the ride. For anyone that is interested in further helping support the channel, you can also check out that join button here on YouTube or the Patreon link in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. A little really goes a long way to keeping this place up and running and bringing more content just like this to all of you. Big shout out to all of our current champions. Y'all are such amazing rock stars. Thank you for keeping us going. But that's going to do it for this one. So until next time, my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome, and we will see you back next video.